Break thou the bread of life, dear Lord, to me. As thou didst break the loaves beside the sea, beyond the sacred page, I seek thee, Lord, my spirit, and for thee, O living word. Bless thou the truth, dear Lord, to me, to me. As thou didst bless the bread by Fetters fall, and I shall find my peace, my all in all. Good evening. We thank you so much for joining us this evening for our midweek Bible study with the Washington Street Church of Christ in St. Albans, West Virginia. My name is Scott Pauley. I'm the minister and the adult Bible class teacher on Wednesday evenings. We're so glad that you have been joining us. If this is your first time, welcome. You are welcome to join us each week as we study the book entitled Amazed by Jesus by Mark Hines. We are in Lesson 8 of Volume 1. There's two volumes in this particular lesson. We are in Book 1, Volume 1, Lesson 8, and we will begin on page 148 this evening. Uh, just a note, hopefully on April the 7th, um, we will be able to get back to our regular services on Wednesday evening. So we will come to the building at 7 p.m. and do our Bible study here together, if all things go well. We hope that's the case. Before we get started, though, this evening, let's have a quick word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for everything that you've done for us. We thank you for the blessings you've given us. We thank you for the healings and, and the, the jobs you give us and the family that you've given us. And Father, we thank you for the jobs that you have given us and, and the money that you give us to survive on. We thank you for the clothing and the food that you give us, Lord. Father, for all the things that you've done for us, we are thankful. Father, we pray that you'll be with us throughout this study. Help us to understand the things that we study that, and we can apply them to our lives and share them with others. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for loving us. In Christ's name, amen. Okay, so we're picking up on page 148 in Lesson 8. This has been a long lesson, and we're not going to get it finished this evening, so uh, it might be another week or so before we actually get done with this lesson. Good lesson, though. It's entitled uh, the, or the Middle Galilean Ministry, and... Uh, we will begin on page 148. We left off last week just at the uh, end of uh, Matthew chapter 13, verses 33 through 35 was the last thing we read talking about. Uh, there was just a, a, a small amount of yeast that it takes to leaven a whole lump of dough and, and how the kingdom of God will, though start out very small at this point, will grow into something very large as it penetrates the earth. So, now we're going to move on to the parables of Jesus that he told to his disciples to help them learn some things. So, after speaking parables to the public or to the crowds, Jesus left the boat that he was in and he went into the house, probably Peter's house in Capernaum, which was pretty much his headquarters in Capernaum there. So he went into the house and he started to explain the parable of the weeds to the disciples. So let's pick up in Matthew chapter 13 at verse 36. Matthew chapter 13, beginning with verse 36. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. 
And his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, the tares are gathered and burned in fire. So it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So the apostles were needing a little bit more information about the parable of the weeds or the tares. Jesus was happy to explain it to them. He, he applied the parable to himself, which made it easier for them to understand. He, the Son of Man, sowed the seed, and it was the seed of the kingdom sown on earth, which resulted in the establishment of God's kingdom and his dominion forever over everything. And it would make the righteous shine like the sun, he said. Now, although sometimes it seems like Satan is winning, this parable assures us that God is in control. Now, at the judgment, the unrighteous will receive the ultimate punishment for their sins, as this parable reveals. Now, Jesus really wants people to change their hearts and their attitudes, which is the reasoning behind what he's preaching. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. So he explains this parable. If you look on page 148, at the very bottom, at figure one or figure 38, you can see the parable of the weeds explained. You see the physical story and then the spiritual application. First of all, you have the sower, which is the son of man, the field, which is the world. Understand, that's the world, not the church. The good seed are the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the devil. The enemy who sowed the seeds, of course, is the devil. The harvest is the final judgment. And the reapers are the angels at the judgment. So, Jesus will tell the disciples these things. And, of course, he's preparing them to be the teachers. He's preparing them to help them understand what these things mean so they can better follow him, number one, and number two, teach others about him. So, we move on to the parable of the hidden treasure in verse 44 of Matthew 13. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and he hid. And for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. So here we have a man or a farmer who finds something that is really valuable. And in order to claim that treasure, he sells everything that he has and buys the entire field so that he could own the treasure that was in it. And that's just like entering the kingdom is, is worth giving up everything. And this parable and the next parable actually go hand in hand with each other. But they're, they're also a very good pairing with the parable of the mustard seed and the unleavened bread or the unleavened loaf because in all four of them the kingdom is hidden and it's waiting to be found which brings us to the next parable the parable of the pearl or the pearl of great price in verses 45 and 46 of matthew chapter 13 
Matthew chapter 13 and verse 45. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. You see, when someone discovers Jesus, he or she will give up everything to have him if they truly discover Jesus and believe in him. And then in verse 47, beginning, we have the parable of the dragnet. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind which, when it was full, they drew to shore. And they sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. So this parable is similar to the parable of the weeds. At the end, all of the good will be separated from the bad, of course, referring to the judgment. And then the parable of the master in verses 51 and 52. Jesus said to them, Have you understood all these things? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he said to them, Therefore every scribe instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out his treasure, or brings out of his treasure, things new and old. So after asking if they they understood what he was talking about, they said yes. But Jesus had one last parable for them at this point. And it applied directly to them. First of all, we see here that he called them teachers of the law. And then he compared them to the master of a house. Or the, um, the, the householder, if you will. But he said that this man knows everything that he owns. And he can find it. You know, perhaps... Some of us are better at remembering where things are than others. Uh, I, I know I can ask my wife where something is in the house, and she can most of the time go and find it. If not, she's got a picture in her mind of where it will be, and she can go find it. Well, as Jesus' disciples, he tells them that they will be knowledgeable enough of his nature and the nature of his kingdom that they will be able to share it readily. And they will know what to say. And if you remember, he'll tell them that the Spirit will help guide them. And he's just reminding them of these things. And he's giving them the confidence that he would want them to have. All right, next we go to our next title, uh, which is called Continuing Opposition. And if you look at paragraph 1 on page 150, we'll read from there. Page 150 at paragraph 1. Resistance to accept Jesus as the Messiah didn't just emanate from people who were mesmerized by his miracles, yet baffled by his parables. The the apostles also misunderstood who Jesus was. Jesus would focus on them for the remainder of his ministry, challenging them and steering their thinking into a new direction to see who he was, and what he was really here to do. So now we have the crossing of the lake and the calming of the storm. Up until this point, Jesus mostly taught in cities and villages along the northwestern side of the Sea of Galilee, Capernaum, Bethsaida. But now Jesus has decided that he was going to travel to the eastern side of the sea to a city called Jerasa. So he and his 12 apostles boarded a boat and began crossing the Sea of Galilee. 
Let's turn to Mark chapter 4 at verse 35. Mark chapter 4 at verse 35 beginning. On the same day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. Now, when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be, that even the wind and the sea obey him? So here they were, on the Sea of Galilee, which would probably be technically a lake to us. It's about 682 feet below sea level, and that allows the winds to come up on it in the afternoon uh, and, and cause up to seven-foot waves. And these winds would were, were, were caused by the mixing of the cool air that would come down from, from the Golan Heights in the northeast, and it would mix with the warm air coming off of the lake, and the storms would happen, or the winds would happen, which would cause the waves to become fierce at some times. But while they crossed the sea, their boat was hit by one of these wind storms, and the apostles were terrified. Water was filling the boat, and, and they looked at Jesus, and, and he was sleeping. And, um, of course, they, was, they were hoping that he could help in some way, but were surprised when they did find him sound asleep and calm and, and being able to sleep when the wind blows. And, and after they woke him, of course, he stood up and he stopped the storm by simply telling it, to be still. What an amazing story. Just by his words, he can calm the seas. It's amazing. And the apostles were amazed at this point. Now, they were initially afraid of the storm, but after this, they were more afraid of Jesus, but with a different type of fear. They're starting to see Jesus in a little bit different way now. And they said to each other, who can still the storm at except for God himself. And of course, the answer to that, well, he is God. Only God can do that. There are several times, actually, in, in Psalms where the, the poets describe God's control of the sea. So by calming this storm, Jesus demonstrates his equality with God. And then, when they get to the shore, there are some demoniacs that are healed of the Gerasenes. So, no sooner than they step off the boat, and they are, they, they are confronted by two demon-possessed men. So, let's pick up reading in Mark chapter 1, or excuse me, Mark chapter 5, at verse 1. Mark chapter 5 at verse 1. Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains because he had often been bound by shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulling apart, had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him, and always, day and night, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. 
And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, What is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Also, he begged him earnestly that he would not send out, send him out of the country, or send them out of the country. Now, a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all of the demons begged him, saying, Send us into the swine, that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about two thousand. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. So those who fed the swine fled, and they told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was that had happened. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legions sitting and clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who saw it told them how it happened to him and who had been uh, happened to him who had been demon possessed and about the swine then they began to plead with him to depart from their region and when he got into the boat he who had been demon possessed begged him that he might be with him however jesus did not permit him but said to him go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you, and how he has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him, and all marveled. So these two demon-possessed men came to Jesus. And then the scriptures begin talking about one in particular man. So Jesus asked this man what his name was. The man answered, Legion, because they were many, he said. Now, Legion is a military term, referring to a group of several thousand Roman soldiers. The man was possessed by numerous demons, so he was called Legion. As we read, approximately 2,000 demons. Now, the demons asked Jesus, that if he was going to do anything to them, to please send them into the herd of pigs that was nearby. So he gave them permission to go there. But perhaps a little twist to the situation. The pigs ran down the, the steep embankment and, and they ran into the lake and they drowned. Of course, this up, upset the pig herders a little bit. They were also afraid, so they would... Uh, begged Jesus to leave because they were so scared. Now, when Jesus was getting ready to leave, the man who had been demon-possessed, or the one that's known as Legion, approached him. He wanted to be a follower of Jesus, which was a good thing. But Jesus said, no, you stay here in your area and tell the people how much God has done for you. And he did. And people were amazed. Turn now, if you will, to Mark chapter 5 at verse 21. Mark chapter 5 at verse 21. Here we see two different females healed, two daughters, if you will. When Jesus returned to Galilee, he healed these two uh, young ladies back to back. One was a 12-year-old a little girl, and the other was an older lady who had been sick for at least 12 years. So Mark chapter 5, verse 21. Now, when he had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came Jarius by name, 
And when he saw him, he fell at his feet, and begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, that she may be healed, and she will live. So Jesus went with him, and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for twelve years, and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had, and was no better, but grew worse. When she had heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, If I only may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. And immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she fell, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus immediately, knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, You see the multitude thronging you, and, and you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. While he was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not be afraid, only believe. And he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, and brother... Uh, <laughs> let, me, let me read that. And he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. Then he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and saw a tumult, and those who wept and wailed loudly. When he came in, he said to them, Why make this commotion and weep? This child is not dead but sleeping. And they ridiculed him. But when he had put them all outside, he took the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him and entered where the child was lying. Then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kumai, which is translated, Little girl, I say to you, arise. Immediately the girl arose and walked, for she was twelve years of age. And they were overcome with great amazement. But then he commanded them strictly that no one should know of it, and said that something should be given her to eat. So no sooner than Jesus got back to Galilee, a great crowd gathered round him, and Jairus, a leader in the synagogue, came to him and, and fell at his feet. And he pleaded on behalf of his little girl and begged Jesus to come to his house and heal her because she was about ready to die. Of course, they started to the house and the crowd followed her. And as they were, fo uh, fo the crowd followed him. And as they were on their way to the house, another woman came and touched the hem of Jesus' garment. So, Jairus and his daughter would have to wait for just a little while. We're going to stop there, and we'll pick up with the rest of this story next week. I do want to remind you, however, that in order to go to heaven, you must be a Christian. In order to be a Christian, you must obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. You must believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, the fact that Jesus is the Son of God, that he was sent to the cross where he died, he was buried, 
And then he rose again on the third day and now sits with God the Father on high and waits for his children to come home. Do you believe that? If so, obey the gospel's commands. You must, upon hearing the gospel, believe it to be true. Repent of your sins, confess your faith in Christ Jesus, and be baptized in water to rise up in a new life, just as Jesus did, for the forgiveness of your sins. And then you must walk in that new life, and you must be faithful to God. Have you done that? Have you become a Christian this day? If not, do not wait till it's too late. Maybe you were a Christian at some point in your life, but you've turned your back on God. Come back to God. He wants you. He is waiting to have you back in His fold. He's waiting to have you back in the family. Just as the angels rejoice over one sinner who repents, that sinner could be you. So come back. If you're not a Christian and we can help you, or if you've fallen away from the church and, and we can assist you in some way in, in coming back, maybe pray, praying for you, let us know. My name again is Scott Pauley. I'm the minister for the Washington Street Church of Christ. We meet at 601 Washington Street in St. Albans, West Virginia. We meet at 9.30 on Sunday mornings for Bible class, and then 10.30 on Sunday mornings for our worship service to God. Come visit with us. We'll also be here on the internet if you're unable to make it out. And then again next Wednesday here on the internet for our midweek Bible study. And again, starting April 7th, we hope to be here in the building together again for our Wednesday evening Bible studies. Thank you so much for joining us. We, we hope that you continue to come back and, and we hope that we see you here at the building as soon as we can all get back together. We thank you so much again. We love you. We'll see you soon. Wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. How shall my tongue describe it? Where shall his praise begin? Taking away my burden, setting my spirit free. For the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea. The rolling sea. Higher than the mountains, sparkling like a salsa, full sufficient grace for even me, for even me. Broader than the scope of my transgression, seeing it greater far than all my sin and shame, my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus, praise His name. Wonderful grace of Jesus. Jesus, reaching to all the lost. By it I have been pardoned, saved to the uttermost. Chains have been torn asunder, giving me liberty. For the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, grace of Jesus deeper than the mighty rolling sea, the rolling sea. Higher ah, than the mountains, sparkling like a salsa, full sufficient grace for, for even me, for even me. Broader than the scope of my transgression, sing it greater far than all my sin and shame, my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus, praise His name. Wonderful grace of Jesus, reaching the most defiled. By its transforming power, making Him God's dear child. 
Church of Sing Peace and Heaven for all eternity. And the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, grace of Jesus. Jesus. Deeper than the mighty rolling sea, the rolling sea. Higher than the mountains, sparkling like a salsa, full sufficient grace for even me, for even me. Broader than the scope of my transgression, sing it. Greater far than all my sin and shame, my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus, praise His name.